Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Tim Moore. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon at Metro Health Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Hope everyone is uh, safe and healthy. I'd like to thank CSRS for uh, this platform and allowing us to have this meeting this year. Also, the Education uh, Committee of the ICL and Dr. Gerling, the ICL chairman. My take is uh, geriatric odontoid fractures, the case for non-operative treatment. Why is there such an issue with this issue? Um, geriatric odontoid fractures, you can find data to support whatever you want to do. We know a lot of things about these fractures. We don't know a lot of things about these fractures. And we're going to talk about those things. And we're going to look at a couple of studies. What we know about these injuries, fracture does not heal predictably. 85-year-old fall from standing height, has a displaced more than 50% odontoid fracture, it's likely not to heal. Failure of healing has long-term implications for some patients, not for all patients. Frac uh, failure of healing is often asymptomatic in patients, but we don't know which patients. We know that odontoid non-unions can have significant implications. This is a patient I treated, known odontoid fracture, treated at our institution. Minor MVC comes in incomplete tetraplegia about five years later. So odontoid fracture non-unions can have significant implications. Malunions can also be an issue. So we wanna be careful, we wanna keep an eye on these uh, fractures. We don't want too much displacement. We definitely don't want C12 dislocations which we'll talk about later. What we don't know are which patients develop symptomatic myelopathy. If we could predict that patient A is gonna develop symptomatic myelopathy, then let's offer that patient surgery to prevent that we don't have that data. We definitely don't have the data about which patients die from the next trauma. The data, please. And the first study I wanna talk about is Bob Molinari's study from 2011. 58 consecutive patients, single institution, Displaced more than 50% got offered posterior C12 surgery. Non-displaced got six weeks of rigid collar immobilization. Fracture healing was improved with surgery, but only about a little greater than one out of four fractures healed versus collar about one out of 20. Non-operative, two thirds developed mobile non-unions. One third, however, didn't. So did does one third of uh, non-operative treatment Fractures heal, we're not sure, but there was no increase in disability or neck pain. Complications much greater with surgery. Surgery imparts greater complications to the patients, about one out of four versus one out of 20 in a collar. Mortality was greater in the surgical patients. This makes sense. Greater morbidity with surgery, your mortality might be increased. The conclusions from a study, surgery creates fracture healing at a higher rate, but not great rate. Disability and neck pain, there is no difference. Surgery does not decrease mortality. Again, surgery does not decrease mortality. The AO Spine North America Geriatric Odontoid Fracture Study, Mortality Study, a retrospective review of mortality outcomes. This is done by the uh, huge uh, giants in spine surgery. 157 non-op, 165 surgical uh, patients. Statistically significant difference in age. The surgery patients were younger. Does that mean they were healthier? Not sure. The length of stay, surgery patients had a longer length of stay. Surgery patients had a longer IC days in the ICU. Feeding tubes were more common in the surgical patients than the non-surgical patients. And their conclusion, surgical treatment of type 2 odontoid fractures in this elderly population did not negatively impact survival even after adjusting for age, sex, and comorbidities. The data suggests a significant 30-day survival advantage and a trend towards improved longer-term survival for surgical patients over non-surgical patients. I agree with this study in many ways. Non, this is a non these are non-randomized groups. Surgery will have more complications and comorbidities. I can't agree with this study in that surgery improves short and long-term mortality. Um, I think this is a huge, uh, an issue of selection bias. Excellent uh, study, but I can't uh, agree that surgery is going to improve mortality. The ideal geriatric odontoid fracture study would be a randomized prospective study of good surgical candidates. So take all those good surgical candidates from the previous study and then randomize them into surgical and non-surgical treatment. And as an outcome uh, uh, data, return to pre-morbid function uh, as the goal, because that's what we want. We want these patients to get back to their pre-morbid function. 
So the data stops there. Okay, so what do you need to think about when you're dealing with these uh, uh, injuries? Fracture factors are extremely important. Displacement, if an 85-year-old comes in with a greater than 50% displaced odontoid fracture, it it's likely not to heal. Always look at the C1-2 lateral mass joints. Um, we are always concerned about displacement, but if that uh, fracture is displaced more than 50%, always make sure that you don't have a C1-2 uh, lateral mass joint dislocation. C1-2 arthrosis, if you're gonna try to treat a very poor surgical candidate in a collar, look at the C1-2 arthrosis. Uh, this patient is likely not to heal their uh, odontoid fracture. C12 arthrosis, so it's almost ankylosed here. Um, a lot of uh, issues. The, the odontoid is very sclerotic. The blood supply is very uh, poor. Even though the posterior hinge is supposedly intact, if I see this patient, I tell the patient, the patient's family, this is a fracture that's likely not to heal. Always look at C12 arthrosis. Surgeon factors you have to have comfort with upper cervical anatomy. Um, you've got to be able to do these things uh, fairly efficiently and safely. Um, in my hands, there's no benefit from doing them acutely. I like to put these patients either in a soft collar or a rigid collar, have them back to clinic, bring their family with them, uh, have a talk to them. Uh, I'd like to do these if we're gonna offer surgery. I like for that to happen about two or three weeks down the road. It, there's less bleeding if it, compared to if you do them acutely. Stable pseudo should be your goal, okay? Don't, uh, I've never taken a light crest bone graft for these. Um, put screws in C1 and C2 safely and efficiently, and that patient is likely to go on to a, at least a stable non-union. What is important patient factors? Functionality, okay? Um, uh, you know, 85-year-olds are much healthier and do more than uh, even when I started practice. So functionality of the patients is extremely important. Comorbidities is, is extremely important. What I hate is horrible uh, COPD, chronic lung disease. Um, these patients tend not to be extubatable. Patient expectations, sit down and talk to these patients, talk to their families, and determine what they want. Because again, it's not always in just in terms of good surgical outcomes. It's the perception of the patient's care. Um, and then surgeon factors are very important, okay? This is me on the left. I drive a 2017 uh, Toyota Camry, great car. Um, I tend to treat uh, patients in uh, rigid cervical collars a lot. John Ree, who's an exceptional surgeon, sub exceptional physician, um, he likes to take these patients to surgery, which you're going to hear. He, it's, I, I've known from uh, good sources he just upgraded to an extremely nice Porsche 911 Turbo. Um, so maybe it depends on what surgeon's goals are also. So um, thank you very much for uh, listening. Um, we're going to stop there. Um, everyone be safe. <laughs>